Okay. Um, this is a talk I did at an RTC last year. Uh, so it's just a, an abridged version for, for you guys. Um, basically, the focus is exactly this. It's about maintaining the models, ensuring that they stay healthy for you and your teams, and preserving your sanity. Um, so when you're working on uh, BIM projects, the, the model itself is, is key to the, uh, to the success of the, the project that you're working on. Um, and really, it's, it's something that you spend the majority of your time working in. So to maintain the health of this, maintain the performance is something critical. Um, so from a BIM perspective, uh, delivering success, there's, there's various different uh, kind of things that you need to look at uh, on your project. So the resourcing itself, so who, who have you got working on your jobs and so the IT side of it and also the training for those individuals. This, this all plays key to the success of, of jobs. How you actually build your models and the structure depending on the complexity of the job. Uh, that's extremely important. And also um, maintaining the discipline within your teams as well. It's all, all well and good having 90% of your team working to the standards that are set on the project and then having that rogue modeler in the corner just coming along and making everything uh, a right mess. And also as well, the content uh, that you're actually using on the project will have a big impact on the overall performance. So um, healthy models means should mean a little bit less of this and a little bit more of this. And translated directly for your boss, this probably means for him a little bit more of uh, this. So um, going back into the kind of real world, and thinking about kind of model performance. Um, Revit itself has, has a system in place for, for managing uh, warnings uh, and basically controlling the performance of the model. And this is the Revit warning system. And it's designed to capture kind of errors that are creeping and kind of create, that are created kind of as it goes along. And also it's, it's maintaining your sanity and the integrity of the model to maintain performance. So there are essentially three types these warnings there's the informative one so basically this is a type of warning that it's telling you something's happened you may have to do something it might be something that you're not particularly um, was a desirable um, uh, effect of what you were working on it might be an accident so perhaps you accidentally deleted a room this tells you that you've done that um, but if you've actually deleted it on purpose then you can ignore it you have the serious ones that you can potentially ignore but potentially um, in reality you probably shouldn't so if you've got duplicate information this might not be necessarily important for, for your project but if you're working on BIM projects where um, the uniqueness or the unique identification of the element if you're using the mark information uh, then obviously this becomes a little bit more important for, that, for those types of projects and then you get the more serious ones that you can't ignore that you actually have to start resolving so these are ones that are actually, if you were to carry on, would muck everything up. So a floor sketch, for example, um, not being complete, it can't create the floor. So therefore you can't move forward with that. And then there's the one that no one likes to see. And that one's the fatal error. But surprisingly, this isn't always fatal. Uh, sometimes, um, you do get fatal errors on your projects and you can say click OK and expect it to close your Revit down and actually it stays live. Uh, those are probably, I should have put in an extra slide here for like zombies because they're kind of like zombie projects that just carry on. You know there's something bad happened inside it and you probably should restart but you actually carry on. So that's, that's Revit's real kind of way of telling you um, that there's something wrong here and something bad has happened inside. So all these warnings, not all of them affect performance, but some of them are critical to projects as well. So, uh, and we'll come on to some of those. And other ones are ones will will have significant impact on performance. These, these warnings you need to kind of rectify on a regular basis. <coughs> So depending on the stage that you're working at for your projects will determine what sort of warnings develop and the frequency that these arise and whether they're actually important for that particular stage as well. So 
you have various different options. Do you ignore the warnings? Can you resolve them or resolve them as the peer? It's quite difficult to do that one, uh, especially if you've got complex uh, time constraints on projects. Employ somebody in the corner that fixes your warnings, essentially wiping your ass. <laughs> or empowering your entire team to fix these problems as they develop. So I'm not going to do a show of hands, but it's pretty obvious which ones aren't an, an acceptable standard. So I'd definitely say that the first two really shouldn't be uh, a policy that you adopt within your organization. Um, certainly, I'm not a big fan of the third one either, but um, occasionally uh, time constraints will mean that models need to be cleaned up at the end of stages. But certainly uh, option four is definitely the preferred option. So option three, yep, yeah, the model does get fixed. Um, but because no one's learning on the project about how these issues are arising, um, this generally means that they tend to occur time and time again, and you end up chasing the tail. So option four, training your team up to resolve the issues themselves. It reduces the likelihood of the issues arising and also ensures that your model maintains constant or certainly optimum efficiency that you could probably expect on the project um, being realistic. But the downside of this is that people need training, um, which is not necessarily a bad thing. So really, um, with regards to option four, it's, it's about asking your team saying, okay, looking at this, um, why did the warning occur? So this is from the training aspect. And once they understand why these occur, they can start um, working in a way that would mean that these warnings wouldn't appear in the first place. So if, for example, what, um, with regards to sketches, if you know that you have to complete the sketch before you click finish, then obviously that, that was one of the warnings, a very simple one that wouldn't occur. So prevention is always better than cure. So at Shepherd Robson, um, we, uh, we take warnings in projects very seriously because we have really uh, big projects uh, and we have projects of all different kinds of sizes. Um, but we've developed a, uh, a tool inside Excel that allows us to analyze all these warnings. I'll just do a quick demo. Is it? Um, I actually developed this uh, a few years ago now, so it's kind of a bit long in the tooth, but essentially we've got a database full of warnings. Uh, these are all developed from uh, historic projects. There's well over 100 different warnings that, that appear. Uh, we'll import a HTML file, which will be exported out from Revit, and that will then analyze all the warnings, provide ongoing data, and then start grouping them together based on the information that we're putting in the database. And what we'll end up doing is it, it highlights all the issues, it shows which ones are severe, which ones are uh, medium and low risk. And also, uh, using this as a tool, you can copy the, the element IDs, which is what you saw there. And you can paste them into Revit, isolate the view, and then you can start considering about the resolution of these errors or issues. So just as an example, this one was Regards walls and room separation lines, this is highlighted them all in this view. Then you can, somebody within the team can actually go through those and resolve them so it makes resolution of errors a lot and warnings a lot quicker. So um, typically, what you'll normally see on projects, you start seeing these peak towards the end of deadlines. Uh, this is pretty normal as people start uh, getting kind of haphazard with the modeling. Um, but you also start seeing different warnings at different stages on projects. Uh, but as, as a company, where we kind of see ourselves going with this is um, like kind of the big data side. We want to start capturing, or we're in the process of developing tools where we're capturing the warnings across multiple projects, or all our projects actually, is, is ultimately what we're aiming for. Uh, and then this will be presented in a dashboard where we can see real time the performance and uh, uh, the number of warnings in our projects and the health ultimately of these uh, files. So it allows us to be proactive because we're getting real-time feedback as to, as to the results. But that's, that's some of where we're, what we're working on at the minute. But um, you've got the analysis side for reviewing. We're also developing tools using Dynamo, obviously. Dynamo is free um, to, to actually resolve some of these issues. So we've developed a Dynamo script that isolates warnings in 3D. But if you're not 
uh, sufficiently capable in Dynamo? Are you still learning it? Or perhaps it doesn't interest you in the slightest. There are tools out there that are free that do similar sort of things. But when you're confronted with thousands of warnings, it's quite difficult to resolve them uh, because basically it gets to the point on projects where there's so many warnings that you think, where do I start? It's like cleaning your bedroom. If, if you leave it for long enough, you just don't want to touch it and it just stays there. Um, but ultimately, the way you should look at these is kind of performance and the have priorities, really. Uh, so number one really is the performance of the model. You want to maintain that the accuracy of the information held within and then the documentation. But as the um, as stead state deadlines approach, these priorities tend to flip themselves. So documentation becomes priority. The accuracy of the model is still paramount and the performance of the model kind of drops off. And that's one of the reasons why these spike. So ensuring happy teams means that you have to manage the warnings on projects because obviously you don't want to see these uh, these warnings drop. So regular, uh, you don't want to see these performance drop and warnings increase. So performing regular model audits is kind of crucial. So what we tend to do ideally, uh, we audit projects on a monthly basis. And typically, uh, at the very least, uh, at the end of each stage. And we have uh, set uh, teams that will do these model audits, they're trained understanding what is good and bad modeling. Uh, typically it's somebody, a member of the uh, central BIM team that carry out those tasks. So these are kind of presented in, we hand over these reports once we've done the audits. So the, we've got our checklists and we identify issues within the model within here as well. So this all supplements the analysis tools that we've, we've shown. Um, so for your practice, or um, for wherever you're working. It's, it's worth to develop a standard list or a standard template of how you're going to tackle these warnings, what's important for you. And so it's, it basically makes producing these audits a lot easier. It's just a checklist. Um, but ultimately you need to be realistic about resolving these. Zero warnings is never gonna happen. There's always, always projects where there's one or two elements that you know you just can't resolve and that warning just sits in there. But providing it doesn't affect performance, then you can kind of have a little bit of a trade-off. So as I said, developing standard templates makes things a hell of a lot easier. So in terms of what we do, uh, we look at uh, compliance against internal standards initially, and then compliance against the project standards. And we start looking at the model structure, to see whether it's built in an appropriate way or a, a good fashion. And then we start going through the visible, so, uh, visible audit so we, we basically work our way around the model, section boxes and uh, section cuts, that sort of thing, and get an understanding of how the model's been put together and pick up good and bad modeling practices. We're not gonna pick everything up in every single audit, but we'll pick up more than not doing anything at all. So in that fashion, it's definitely worthwhile doing. So in terms of tools, there's plenty of tools out there for you to use. There's, uh, from Autodesk, there's the free model checker. Uh, this is a rule-based model checking component uh, tool that's available. Uh, so you can set this up to, to work against your own internal company standards. Uh, you can check various different things. So the number of in-place families that people are using. It's not a, not a really easy <coughs> thing to check. You can use uh, Dynamo for it these days, but um, being able to have just like a model checker where you can just click a button and it just identifies all your in-place elements inside the project is, is a really good thing. Also, number of design op options you're using, um, depending on the project, uh, you may want to ensure that those are cleaned out uh, once you finish using them. Um, the number of objects as well that you can purge. There's a lot of things within here that you can actually see where these warnings exist in different parts of your model, but the beauty of a model checker is it just brings everything into one place. It saves you having to route around your model to pull all this information. So in place families, yeah. Um, I have my own little anecdote on this one. Um, there was one guy um, in, in our office, um, <laughs> I'll, I'll openly admit, um, and we, were do, we had this atrium where we had these timber slats and he'd modeled one slat 
uh, as an in-place component. And then in an elevation, he just kind of copied that slat again and again and again, and just made changes to it, just like you would in SketchUp. Well, that's great, but it actually meant we had about 1,500 in-place elements that were just related to those timber slats. So obviously we found those, we, um, we punished the guy um, appro <laughs> appropriately um, within the law. Um, and we, we replaced all those in-place elements with uh, curtain wall and mullions, which was far more efficient and obviously massively reduced the number of in-place families. Um, Pergible <coughs> content. So getting rid of this kind of stuff is really important for your model because it just bloats it. If you've got loads of families that you're not using anymore, um, Revit needs to load that stuff into the memory when you first open the file. So if you're bringing the file size down from 300 meg down to 200 or whatever the size of projects you're working on, it will make a big difference in terms of performance. So in the example that we, uh, we performed here, uh, it's going from about 39 seconds to open the model to round about 30. Um, so it might not sound a lot, but if you time that across your entire team and the time takes it, it takes to save the central and those kind of tasks, then it, this, uh, these performances start becoming um, uh, of a size that are calculable. Uh, design options that I talked about. You want to try to get rid of these uh, as soon as you can. Uh, room space and volume calculations. Now these, um, having it set to calculate areas and volumes within your model um, does significantly affect performance. So in these instances, if, uh, if you know you don't need it, uh, then always set it to areas only. Um, whereas if you do need it, I recommend that it's off until you have to issue the model or issue data from the model. So that, that will have a significant performance on, on your model. Essentially, instead of your rooms calculating just the footprint, it now has to calculate the volume of the space as well. Model lines. Um, importing DWGs into 3D views might seem like a good idea, uh, especially if you're importing it into all your views, but trust me, it's not. Um, not only does it affect performance, it imports a lot of crap that takes ages to get rid of, uh, line styles, um, fill patterns, um, imported uh, categories, and, um, subcategories. Um, and also as well, if you're in an elevation and somebody's imported a, a topographical 3D topographical survey, you see all the lines from that, which you definitely don't want to see. So it means in those kind of instances in elevations, for example, it means that exporting your PDFs takes longer because you've got a lot more line work in there and the PDFs are larger file sizes as well. So these results are, or these issues are kind of cumulative. Uh, groups, um, excessive number of groups in your projects are a bit of a no-no, so you want to try to keep these out as uh, much as possible. Uh, raster images, <laughs> if you've got renders, those sort of things obviously increases file size, so if you don't need them, so again, views that aren't placed on sheets. This is, this is one that we suffer with an awful lot, that people will create work in progress views. Um, they'll just cut a section just to interrogate part of the model, but they won't delete that. So um, what we've started to do now is modify the, uh, the browser settings so it only shows within the project browser. It only shows the views that aren't placed on sheets so we can very easily see ones that aren't placed and people can consider whether they actually need those in the first place and clean them up. So again, it's about prevention rather than having to go back afterwards and sort it out. Uh, levels. Having loads of levels in your model um, is, is a real pain in the ass. Um, if you're trying to draw a wall, for example, it'll try snapping up to the next level, uh, going up to the next level or constraining up to the next level. Um, or you may end up kind of, if you're copying things around your model, it'll go onto a level that you're not interested in. And that might not sound too bad, but if you start deleting levels, then sometimes the elements that are hosted on those levels will be deleted as well. Now that then becomes an issue because you don't get a warning about those. And that will have a significant impact, not on performance, but when you issue your drawings further down the line and you realize that half the stuff on one level has disappeared and you're looking around the room to see who to blame. So uh, in terms of tools, um, there's IDA, 
Idea Explorer. This is a really good tool for interrogating the models and doing audits. Uh, you can very quickly see what kind of groups, whether you're importing stuff, um, whether it's imported into particular views, and how many views and sheets, and how many views you don't have on sheets as well. So it gives you a very quick and easy way to look at stuff. But obviously, it's, it's a paid tool, so um, it's not, not for everybody. Again, um, we use Libri Model Checker, and we're looking to develop, um, certainly this year, standardized um, rule checks. So at the time of model issue or the end of stage, certainly we do this at the end of stage anyway, where, especially where we act as information managers, and actually validate and verify uh, the design and some of the information and data inside it. Uh, so certainly ensuring that we're complying with our data requirements on projects using the um, using classification and uh, and rules within Salibri to check to see whether A, our classifications are in there to start with and B, whether they're appropriate for the elements that we've actually selected. Uh, Dynamo, Dynamo is a great tool. Um, you can do all kinds of stuff with Dynamo and if you come along to Dynamo event, then hopefully if you're relatively new to it, you might pick up more stuff. I won't talk about that too much. Um, so, free planning structures of your models uh, is really important to performance as well. Take a little bit of time at the start of your job to just sit down and think how are we going to tackle this, how are we going to set this model up, and what are the implications of this particular scheme. Uh, so, we've, we've worked on resi jobs where we have multiple sites, multiple buildings. Uh, where we split them up in various different ways. And it's about learning the lessons that you've done on other projects and deciding what's the most efficient way to move forwards. There's always in industry peers that can offer advice on that kind of thing as well. So I'm a massive advocate of using work sets. Uh, word of warning though, ensure that everybody's not working within the central file. I've just got to rattle through these now because I'm running a little bit behind. Um, so work sets, the way I think of work sets is a little bit like uh, <coughs> levels. Essentially that's what it is within Revit. Um, Revit already has kind of a, a layering system, if you will, it's, it's uh, the categories. So why do you actually have to double it up? So the way you use work sets is very much different. If you remember the days in the dark days when people were using AutoCAD uh, and you'd have a massive list of layers, well this is this is way too many, and this really isn't appropriate to Revit. Um, work sets should be used primarily now to control visibility and uh, ensure faster performance rather than being able to switch things on and off. But you can use them for visibility as well. And obviously, to ensure performance when you're opening models inside, uh, inside Revit, if you include these specify work sets when you create the central file, then it, and using that option, you can choose to turn off particular work sets that aren't required for your modeling task at that time, and that will massively improve performance. Uh, you can divide models. Uh, so basically, in this example, various different size projects, we've used a different number of work sets to control the visibility of, of the project. So with a basic set of work sets and a basic set of tasks, you can, if you're just working on the exteriors, for example, you can hide all the interior. Again, if you're doing elevations, generates the elevations a heck of a lot quicker. If you're working on the interior, then you're not interested in the site, so you can have that turned off. Uh, if you're doing coordination, then you can just look at the structures. That could be on one work set. Uh, and then for larger projects, you might split them up horizontally or vertically, depending on the requirements. And then mega projects, um, yeah, you have to think very carefully about the sort of stuff you do on those as well. So just to rattle through, I think there's about 30 of these, so I'll go through them really quick. Um, things that affect your, affect your model performance, so uh, number of warnings, so we've talked about that, file size, reduce the amount of annotation that you've got in there in complex geometry. If you've got a really old um, dusty machine that has been recycled from user to user, Consider whether you actually you need your company needs to invest in your hardware. Um, also, the model structure we've talked about that. 
reducing the amount of groups and in-place modelling is good modelling practice. Uh, rooms, reducing the amount of 2D line work. If you can have it inside intelligent families, speed things up. Design options. Model constraints, so things like locks. Um, having alignment constraints. Um, they sound great, but if you've got a really large project and you're trying to move things around and then loads of stuff has been locked, then it really does affect performance. Void-based families. Um, this means that Revit has to calculate the shape and the void and then cut it out before we present it on the screen. So it's doing multiple calculations rather than actually just create the geometry itself. So consider actually whether you need to use voids and you can use solids instead. Uh, grouped arrays. If you've got links in there that you don't need, absolutely chuck them out. Uh, yeah, I'm going to rattle through these. So if you do need presentation and you want to get hold of this, you'll be able to get it online anyway. So uh, if you don't need to do high levels of detail, um, try working in course. Uh, obviously, it'll mean that when you switch views, it'll do it a lot quicker. Area schemes, uh, the number of area, uh, area separation lines, if you don't need those, Clear them out. Uh, complicated railings <coughs> massively affect performance. Uh, Joaquin did something uh, probably a few years ago now, maybe, on, on railing and how the importance of um, having using the right level of detail for the right elevation and that how that significantly affects performance in your output. Um, walls extending through levels and joining to multiple but intersecting walls. Uh, it basically takes a hell of a lot of time to calculate those wall joins because it looks at all the different permutations. Room separation lines are the devil. Um, when they overlap with walls, intersect with walls, um, they massively perfect, affect performance, as do rooms as well, which I think I talked about before anyway. So also as well, something that people kind of overlook is really complicated starting views. Everyone loves to see <coughs> the current progress of their model. And everyone wants to have a 3D axo or a perspective on their splash screen. So when they open up the model, they see exactly where the model's up to. Great. But it takes five minutes to open. Death. So in those kind of instances, yeah, don't do that. Um, what I would recommend, if you do want <coughs> something like that, just generate a JPEG and then whack it on there instead. It will massively speed up the opening times. Uh, Putting uncropped views, plans onto sheets where there's loads of stuff around the outside, it's a big no-no. Um, modeling with shaded <laughs> shadows and realistic views. I've seen this, people complain, oh, as it takes so long to switch views, it's because they've got shadows on <laughs> and they, because it looks pretty, um, but they're not thinking about performance. So it makes me think as though I've got an office full of liners, but they're not, they're not that. Um, color schemes, having these permanently on, uh, if you don't need them, again, um, you don't need your views to look pretty while you're doing your modeling. Um, you need your sheets and your annotation that's going on those sheets to look pretty, but not the general kind of work in progress views. Uh, anyone who's in structures, um, having the structural analytical tab actually visible inside Revit means that it does calculations in the background. So if you're not a structures person, I recommend that you go into the settings and turn off the structures in there and it will mean your model will run a little bit quicker. Uh, structures, again, obviously if you've got loads of, if you've got detail, connection <coughs> details, that's gonna affect performance. Uh, MEP, any MEP in there today? We've got two, All right, great. Um, it'd be nice to get a few more in and maybe a few presenting. So if you've got buddies, I'm going to bring them down. Um, there is there is a separate MEP group, but obviously, um, if you share your knowledge, then everyone learns. Um, so yeah, having your bi-directional <coughs> flows turned on for your um, for your pipe work and for and your connections that sort of thing. Uh, if you don't need them on, um, if it doesn't need to be bi-directional. Uh, then switch switch those to just one way uh, and that will affect performance obviously because it, it needs to kind of work out which way it's facing so if you can switch that over then that's great exploded DWGs enough said on that one <laughs> uh, raster raster files um, yeah. 
So basically, uh, just the overall kind of watch points. So make sure you plan from the outset uh, how your model is going to be set up. This can have massive implications over the mo modeling performance as it moves on. Stay on top of your warnings. And ideally, fix them as they arise. Train your staff or train the guys sitting, sitting next to you to understand what these warnings mean and your models will stay, stay healthier for longer. And also, uh, if you can, uh, carry out regular mo model audits. Certainly try to do one every stage. Ideally, if you're in a position of power within your organization, see if you can get this in your um, quality management or QA procedures. You say at the end of every stage, we will do this, and then you can get back, back, back up, especially if it's written into ISO, that sort of thing. And also, as I said, make your teams understand what good modeling is. And finally, the use of work sets to manage uh, visibilities. That's, um, that's good modeling. Okay, so maintaining happy models means healthy teams, more productive teams, and ultimately means cheesy picture. Uh, thank you very much. I'll get rid of that one. <laughs>